On one occasion, when Jesus was going to the house, a leader, uh, the house of a leader of the Pharisees, to eat a meal on the Sabbath, they watched him closely. Just then, in front of him, there was a man who had dropsy. And Jesus asked the lawyers and Pharisees, is it lawful to cure people on the Sabbath or not? But they were silent. So Jesus took him and healed him and sent him away. Then he said to them, if one of you has a child or an ox that has fallen into a well, will you not immediately pull it out on the Sabbath day? And they could not reply to this. When he noticed how the guests chose the places of honor, he told them this parable. When you are invited by someone to a wedding banquet, do not sit down at the place of honor in case someone more distinguished than you has been invited by your host and the host who invited both of you may come and say to you, give this person your place. And then in disgrace, you would start to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit down at the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table with you. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. He said also to the one who had invited him, when you give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite your friends or brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors in case they may invite you in return and you would be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. The Gospel of the Lord. You, Lord. Let us pray. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come as the wind and cleanse. Come as the fire and burn. Convert and consecrate our lives to our great good and your great glory, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated. In Luke's Gospel, this is the sixth story that happens on the Sabbath, on a Sabbath day. And of those six, four involve doing something on the Sabbath that you're not supposed to do. Actually, four of them involve Pharisees. Four of the six involve Pharisees. So what Luke is saying is, pay attention. Sabbath, doing something, Pharisees, is going to be conflict. We're going to have some conflict. And the reason I so wanted to read, and I think it's essential that we read this first part, because the reason they were watching Jesus closely, as it says in the first verse, is because they had invited this fellow with dropsy, which is edema, a swelling, a retention of water, <laughs> Not be, to feed him, but to set Jesus up. This reminds me of one of my heroes, a guy by the name of Claude Pepper. He used to be Senator Pepper. He was a senator actually when President Roosevelt was the president of the United States. And then, and then he, uh, he was destroyed, or his political career was destroyed until 1965 when he ran for Congress in Florida and served for many years and was an advocate for the older, old, old people, older people, for senior citizens. Um, and he was destroyed by 
one of his uh, protégés, a guy by the name of Smathers. And, and it was the big companies that wanted to destroy Pepper. So what they did is they hired African-American men at the end of his speeches to stand stationed at the stair that he would have to walk down. And that man would hold out his hand, and there'd be a cameraman right there to take a picture of Claude, Senator Peppa, shaking the hand of an African-American man. Destroyed his political career. He wasn't bitter, though. But anyway, I digress. But what I do want to say is the fellow with the edema is not there to eat. He, he is there to, to be a setup for Jesus' destruction. And, and Jesus handles this so well, he says, well, what should I do? What should I do, guys? I mean, you're the Pharisees. You're the... They don't say anything. Scoundrels. Scoundrels. So Jesus does what Jesus does, which is meets people in need exactly where they are with what they need. And he heals the man and then he sends the man away. Because he says, believe me, you don't want to suck with these guys. Trust me, if I could go, I'd go too. <laughs> and then he seemingly gives this, this thing about how to be a good host. And it's actually very clever, and I, and I've been, I thought and I prayed a lot about, you know, why is he teaching these scoundrels how to become better scoundrels? If you want to be raised in the esteem of the eyes of your friends, act wicked humble, like you don't care about stature, so that you'll have all kinds of stature. And then it got me thinking about work. And you know, on the Sabbath day, we're not supposed to work. We're supposed to rest and turn our attention to God. And it's as if God is saying, you know, I know you got to make a living. I know you have all the things to attend to in the human condition. I've been there, I know that. But on the Sabbath, baby, I want you all to myself. I want you all to myself. I want you to be paying attention to me. And part of the reason we have the Sabbath is to give the world a break from us. You know, the earth must just sigh, oh, thank God, it's Sunday, you know? Our organizations must, like, totally take a sigh of relief, oh, thank goodness. You know, all these little machinations that they're working on, oh, I get a day of rest from all of this. Um, but I believe the Sabbath is also, and pr perhaps principally, to preserve us from the sin of striving. The sin of striving. It's a little like pride. Well, what's the matter with, you know, what's the matter with striving? Well, let's suggest, let me suggest that we're given work to do, that God gives us work to do to serve God and each other. And that that's what our jobs are. And that right work is finding the work that enables one to do it well, but also to connect with the deeper meaning of work. So it's kind of funny if, they did a survey of hospital workers and they asked the janitors, what is your job? Give us your job description. And their job description was all about tending to the patients and spending time with the patients because nurses and doctors didn't have time to do that. That was their job. That's where they found meaning. That's where they did service. And this business of striving is doing our jobs in such a way that people will notice and advance us. It takes us out of the work of service and puts us into a place of ego. And that's always hell. It's, it's, it's always scarce and, and impoverished. And so God says, I'm going to give you a break from striving. Jesus, using this parable, is saying to them, this clever advice I'm giving you, is all about striving, and you're striving too on Sunday on the Sabbath. You strivers, 
You invited me here not to serve some greater purpose or work, but because you knew that by putting me on the spot, you would raise in stature. You're supposed to take a break from striving, from conniving. And I think, I think, I, I believe what might have happened is Jesus then said, I gotcha. I gotcha. I know what you're thinking. When I, when I lived in East Germany, I, I, can have, I have sympathy for Jesus, we all do. When I lived in East Germany in the 1985, I was a student there and the only American. And I would regularly be placed in situations with professors where they would call me up and humiliate me or try to humiliate me as a way to burnish their communist bona fides. If they could figure out some way to look, to make the capitalist, en the, the class enemy look foolish. And it's really hard. I mean, you're, you know, you're here, you have professors and, and they're doing really mean stuff so they can burnish their image. I also had students who would do that. You know, who'd want to get in an argument with me in public so they could sort of burnish. It's just not comfortable. And, and there's nothing good about it. But Jesus is not done instructing us. And he says to the host, well, you heard what he said. I don't want you to be inviting people who are going to pay you back. I want you to invite people who can't pay you back. And, and hang on there because we're going to take a little leap. This is why church can't be a respectable place. Okay? Church cannot be a respectable place. Because if we start becoming a respectable place, we're going to show up so that people will see that we're showing up and that we're going to raise in their estimation. You know, you should belong to St. John's. There's a lot of business people. You could really get some good accounts. <laughs> you know? That makes great sense to the world. But what happens is it creates a culture of club, and it creates a culture of transactional relationship and not love. And not love. Jesus says, no, no. I want you to invite the folks who can't do a darn thing for you. And I think Jesus is saying this. Oh, and by the way, he's not saying all the time. You know, Jesus had family parties. He spent time with the apostles, his buddies. We don't have to read this like Jesus is saying, every single time you get together, you gotta drag somebody in. No, but on occasion, you know, maybe kind of regularly invite someone who needs to be there more than you need them to be there. Sure, why not? I'm going to take another leap with you now. Hold on. This has to do with sheep and the liturgy. And I think this, I think this has something to do with why it is that we need to come to church. And we need to come to church not for what we can get out of it, but for what God can get out of us and make of us what we can't make for ourselves. In the Christian tradition, what was different, what was distinct, is a thing called fictive kinship, which means that Christians were interacting with each other not based on their blood relations, but on their relationship and their commitment to following Jesus. See how they love one another. See how they love one another. And it doesn't come easy to love and invite people who are different from ourselves, particularly if there's, like this, you know, if there's an economic disparity, all of that. It's really hard. It's really hard to look at someone on the street who's homeless as though they're really my brother. 
I mean, if it was my brother on the street, man, I would treat that person differently than if, than the person I see on the street. And, and, or I think of someone, you know, we have a, someone that's in our orbit called Matt, Matthew. And uh, I think of his parents in Colorado. They know that this is a parish that gives Matt a place to sleep, that looks after Matt. He's their kin. And so as Christians, we're called to make each other kin. And we cannot do that. We simply can't do it without God's help. And I want to tell you a story about sheep. I, I learned this when I was on sabbatical. That there are cases where if a little lamb's mommy dies in birth, that they cannot introduce this lamb to other sheep, mommy sheep, use because they won't accept them. They won't bond with them. And you know what they do? I'm going to tell you right now. They take the, um, they find a ewe that had a stillborn. Or, or in which the lamb died. And they skin that lamb, and they weave, they, they lay the skin of that dead lamb over the little orphaned lamb, and they tie it up, and they introduce it to the mommy who's lost their little lamb, because they hope, and the expectation is, that the mommy is going to smell her own flesh and blood on that little lamb and take that lamb in. Man, that's kind of, it's a little horrifying, but it's also like, hey, whatever it takes. Talk about sacrifice. Whatever it takes. And you know, I think this is what happens at Eucharist. That when we on our own see each other, I don't see you as my kin. I don't see you as my family. I don't see Matthew or anybody as my family. But when I come up for communion, what God is doing, he's not putting God's skin over me, but he's saying, I want you to imbibe me because by virtue of your kinship with me, you are kin to each other for real for real. So as we receive communion, and I say to you what St. Augustine used to say when he served communion, which is receive what you are, the body of Christ. Receive what you are, the body of Christ. That in that we are called to consume God's body. And in doing so, we become kin and we are no longer separated from each other, and we belong to each other. And what's even more is everybody out there belongs to us as kin. Invitation for this week, look at everyone you meet who's in any kind of distress or embarrassed or any kind of, hell, look at everybody as kin. And I think we will be transformed. Amen.